What's up, everybody? It's Joe LaPuma. You are listening. You are watching the Complex Sneakers podcast. I am not with my guys today, but we're still Damn here hurts. in front of me on Skype. My man, Mr. Matt Welty. I reach far enough. Maybe I can touch the screen. <laughs> reach out and touch okay. <laughs> okay. And look at my guy. He, what is that? A soccer jersey I see faintly it, in the distance? It's not a soccer jersey, Joe. What is it? It's a, it's a hurling jersey. Okay, I can't read it well, so. Kill Kenny Cats. Something, something okay. from, from my people in Ireland. Are you wearing the same okay. socks that you got roasted for on Full Size Run a couple weeks ago? <laughs> well, wow. taking it immediately to my socks. Okay. I think, I think these might be those socks. I have done laundry since then. People thought you were barefoot when yeah. you took the shoes off. I was wearing socks then. I'm wearing socks now just in case anybody needs to know. But enough about me. We need to talk about Welty's footwear, and I'm not talking socks, yes. right? Yes. Not what I'm wearing. Not, yes. not what you're wearing, but some footwear. No. You I, I want to cut right to the chase here because what a shining moment in, in, yes. in sneaker history, in, in Welty's personal footwear journey. You want to know, know what's funny? Tell us. Quick aside. What? Uh, packing to come to the podcast today. Okay. Pack the shoes. Forgot to pack the laptop. That's why. That's why it's not here. Okay. He was today. focused on the flex above all. Wow! Else. You forgot I, the. Wait! I don't even see. I can't even see. Joe, I, the I, I, I I packed my laptop charger. Didn't put the laptop in the bag. Put the shoes in. Priorities. As as people may know, full size run episode last season. Mm -hmm. Guess Nick Diamond. Mm -hmm. That episode was a roller coaster. Five minutes before the episode started, I got up. Grab my laptop, and the screen on my laptop <laughs> shattered. I totally forgot. <laughs> I love that we're going deep into your laptop problem No, history. but I'm just setting up. Yeah, 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 of course. So I had to record the episode from my phone. It was super choppy, but mm -hmm. we had Nick on. Um, we talked about the Complex Con Nike SB release, Brendan mm -hmm. almost dying in like a riot. You getting- I'll give my life for this shit if I have to. Me getting the shoes off an alley-oop from Welty. Joe getting the shoes, Brendan getting the white ones, and then kind of in the background, Brendan saying that I wasn't gonna get the canaries that Nick had promised me the white shoes. I was mistaken. Wasn't the case. It took a few months for the shoes to, to touch down. Shout out to Nick Diamond. Thank you very much. I don't wanna like make light of that. I'm very pleased. Yes. So this morning, I'm walking downstairs to go mm -hmm. do my workout in front of the apartment with two 50 pound dumbbells in hand. Open up. Just the, so you know how big the dumbbells are. Don't, don't, open don't up, skip over that detail. Open up okay. the front door in like in the little mail area. I see a box. I look down, I drop the dumbbells. It you says, dropped the dumbbells? Like literally just uh, boom. Yeah, yeah. You just dropped them? Yeah, and then I see the box. It says Diamond Supply Co. I rush up the stairs. I just leave the dumbbells right in the hallway. <laughs> Um, just go up and crack it open. Yeah. I'm like, fingers crossed it's the shoes. Cause if, not, not that I would have been disappointed, but I was expecting these maybe at some point. Yes. And it was them. Um, how, how much destruction did you do to the box? I know that when you say crack it open, you must have ripped that thing Rabbit. apart. No, yeah. I, I was actually, I was actually, I was actually, uh, I was actually pretty, uh, delicate. Yeah. As those can see, it says wealthy, a pair of canary diamonds. For you, enjoy ND or Nick Diamond. Uh, also, great signature. The the N with the diamond, right? Yeah, yeah, amazing signature. Amazing. I can't believe this. This came to fruition. This is literally years in the making. Wealthy getting the shoe, the Canary Diamond SB Dunk, the yellow pair, the super rare pair. Beautiful shoes. Nick, they are friends and family have. only release on mm -hmm. the yellows, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, this ended up being Nick Diamond's personal pair. 11 and a half. Um, I don't know how many 11 and a halfs are out there. Can I see it? Yeah. Are we doing a throw? You, you well, trust I, me with the I shoes enough to toss them like that? Wealthy, this immediately becomes the most valuable sneaker in your collection, probably, right? Yeah, hands down. Um, this is the. But of course, it's not about that. No, because this, oh, this is a gift. Obviously. No, this is, this He's is not like. Resell the, He's definitely no. not reselling those. No, not at all. Um, this is a huge. Just so the listeners can really take part in the experience with us, I'm going to do a little bit of ASMR. Okay. This is, okay, this is how it feels it. when you pull the swoosh. 
off the Velcro on your diamond. As but just relax. Dunn Dun is the friend who, when you get the brand new toy, starts <laughs> toying with, like, it breaks starts, it. Listen, just re, just it breaks exactly, my GI like, Joe hey, action figure. Exactly, like you just wrapped the you just wrapped it out of the plastic. Dunn's the one taking the swooshes off. Just <laughs> relax a little bit. Beautiful. <laughs> my uh, Instagram DMs are. A, I'm mess, gonna toss him back to you. Mess right now. Uh, I, I feel so. I feel so nervous throwing this I'm shoe throwing. to him, even though yeah. it's a, so perfect throw. People, awesome. I actually was the funny part is I was getting comments about people saying, "Oh, why did he ruin the box of a shoe that's worth that much money?" And I was like, "No, hey, what are you talking no. about? The guy who designed no the sneaker signed the box for me. Like yeah. that's amazing. It's like a piece of history." Oh, I can't and believe that signature that's, that's, is like, that's, you, that's the power of full size run in a complex. You see that? Podcast. That's history right there. there you yeah. go. Anyways, that's, listen, we're happy for you. Shouts to Nick Diamond making good on his promise. What a pair to get. Happy that you got it today and we're filming this today. So enjoy those, man. Joe, do we got to take a photo of the three of us? Me and you in the canaries and Brendan in the, in the white ones? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm happy for you, man. The, I'm happy for yeah, you. Yeah, the white ones are the white ones are great too. The white ones are great too. I'm happy to have them. You have a funny story about that shoe too, but I don't think you want to tell them the podcast. I I, I, th I think I told it already. No, right? oh, you had an aside to it. Oh yeah, yeah. We don't need to get into the the, the subplot of my diamond okay. SB dunks, but th there are there are several funny stories around those. <laughs> How's the office feel? A little, a little, little light empty without, without you, Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're missing. We're missing your energy, but we're happy to have you, um, you know, at a distance. Where are you right now? I'm in Miami. I'm in Miami. We're shooting some episodes of Sneaker Shopping. Uh, it went, one of them we shot already went really well. No hints, cannot give hints, I'm sorry. And we have another one tomorrow, and yeah, the season continues, just like you guys. You guys shooting this week? Yeah, yeah, Friday. Yep, yep, yep. I was wondering, Joe, yeah. you're in Miami. I was just wondering if you're going to do like 2015 JLP poolside photo with the fly knits on the cabana chair? No, no, those days are over. Those days are <laughs> over. I'm actually wearing beaters now, like those super zoom that I talked about that I ID'd. I've yeah, been wearing yeah. them kind of, you know my style a little bit. No socks sometimes, I'm not going to lie. Uh, no socks and, and I'm, I don't wear sandals really that it's much. It's quite okay for in, a gangster to wear sandals. You know that, right? I, I know it is, but but even in, a, in warm weather, I, I, I just... Foam runners like, on the beach? Uh, I didn't bring foam runners. No, I didn't. Mistake. I didn't. I didn't. You know what's funny, though? You know what's funny? I shot an episode that, of Sneaker Shopping that's coming out later. And off camera, someone asked me about the foam runners. And they were like, what's the deal with this? And I was like, honestly, and, and I've said this in the Yachty Closet episode, the people who have them love them. And the guest was like, I just don't know if I like could wear them. And... I was like, well, this is how like some people are wearing them and done. I brought up the picture that we'll put in this of you okay. on vacation in with the waves going through mm -hmm. the, the, the sea foam spraying around yeah. my foam runners. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. waves going through the foam runners. But I did reference your Instagram. You were you were on some tropical island. You know, you never yeah. put never put the location. But I was like, this is how <laughs> it's done, essentially. No pun intended. Thank you. I was hoping, Joe, that you were going to go like uh, the Irishman in that scene in Miami. Have you seen that movie? I haven't, but tell me. <laughs> Have you yeah, seen yeah, it, yeah, Brendan? Yeah, there's a, there's a scene where they, where they meet up with, I forget what the character's name is, but he shows up like 15 minutes late to the meeting, has like, he has on a pair of shorts, he has like an uh, unbuttoned shirt yeah, halfway, yeah, yeah. has a pair of white uh, loafers <laughs> no. on. Maybe you could have broke out the ALDs and just finally got the fit off. <laughs> the wealthy's patiently waiting for it. The Irishman is the movie that's super, super long, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think it's worth the watch. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm, yeah. I'm the type to maybe fall asleep during a movie sometimes, but I was awake the whole time. Cobble Hill Cinema. Wow. I could never, th I probably couldn't stay still for that long in a theater. It'd have to be like in parts, like a couple hours a night. Joe, you, were, you weren't here today, but we did run into another goat right before we shot this. That's right. Sean Evans was hanging out in the office. We would be remiss not to mention that when you ask about the energy around here that our dear friend and coworker Sean Evans was in the mix working on some stuff and we got to catch up with him, which anytime you get to catch up co with a coworker in this era, it feels yeah. special because yes. we don't get to see anybody in yes. person, but always a pleasure to see that bald man floating around. Uh, so let's talk some sneaker news. Yes. The 50 dunks have been unveiled officially. We've had an episode last week about Off-White 
mm -hmm. or two mm -hmm. weeks ago about off-white, and then I think a couple weeks before that we did, is Nike making too many dunks or not mm -hmm. enough? And officially it seems that the 50 dunks that Virgil has coming soon have been unveiled around the country. Yeah, it seems like everybody is most into the first pair and the 50th pair, and I kind of agree with that. Yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head all the different material combinations that are involved. I'm not much of a suede guy, so I'm, I'm hoping to uh, get the leather pairs rather than the suede pairs in terms of these dunks. We still don't know a lot about how they're rolling out, but I do know that Nike is going to be, and I've said this before, very intentional about it. And I think there's going to be some detailed plan around how to make these sneakers fair. And I think in some ways that rollout may be more interesting than the actual sneakers because I do think, you know, you know, when people hear, oh, there's 50, 50 shoes releasing, Virgil's going to do 50 Nikes that you're anticipating a different yeah. shoe for every single iteration. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know 48 of them look quite similar to each other, which... Yeah. Is a weird thing. I don't necessarily or think 49, it's a right? bad thing. Well, no, the 48 and then the silver swoosh white one oh. and then the black, the silver swoosh black one at the end of it. So the, the, the middle, I guess you could say 48, kind of all looking pretty, pretty similar. Well, we know that Joe only wants one out of the 50. It's, it's true. You're right. The black one. You're right. I, I, went, I went through, I went, when I was hair. going through it, and we finally, you know what? I, I didn't see like the, I, maybe I lost count of like the slide numbers. Yeah or whatever, and when we finally got to the end, I thought that he was gonna like switch it over with the black pair and then do it the same thing with the with the black oh, ones. Oh, like 25 black pairs or yeah. 20 black pairs and or something nope, like that? Nope, just one, so we know which one Joe's going for. You know what, Joe, I actually felt a little bit maybe of what you feel in terms of not wanting to wear white sneakers, because this past weekend I was eating, it was a dangerous, a dangerous choice, okay. but I was eating some chocolate cake ice cream Okay. And I had on white sneakers, I had on the Mini Jordan 3s, and I had on white jeans. And usually I'm a milkshake Ooh. guy. I, I like to get a milkshake okay. pretty much every weekend, but I've been trying to do the cone thing a little bit lately to make my money last a little longer. Yep. And I really don't like, I've realized, eating ice cream from a cone because no matter what the weather is, it's going to drip on you. So this cone is dripping all over my hand. I have on the white Drip jeans. too hard? It, it, definitely too yeah. hard. Any, yeah. any, any dripping is too hard. Today. So it was, I, I felt like... Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, who I do share a birthday with, but trying not wow. to drop any ice cream on my sneakers or my white jeans. And for the most part, I, I was successful, although my companion at the time, I did get a little bit of chocolate ice cream on her collar of her shirt, so I have to apologize. You gotta get, you gotta get the John Elliott Skittles jeans, where he kept- What is that? He had a white, so he had, a, they're actually a great pair of jeans, if I'm- A Skittles Correct, jeans? he had like, yeah, they're called the Skittles, and he had a, no, nope, he had a bag of Skittles in his pocket and he wore these jeans nonstop, these white jeans, and they like started turning colors from like the Skittles being in his pocket. Did he sell and this? Is this an actual item you can buy? Yes. Yes, you so can look I it up. I look this up. They're a great pair of jeans. They're like kind of colored. It's white, but kind of colored. And it's like through that distressed, colorful type of So then of you style. can just wipe your hands on your pants no matter what you're eating, flaming yeah, hot Yeah, the Cheetos, ice cream. Yeah, listen, some, you have a vanilla flan, ice cream yeah. with the with the rainbow sprinkles, exactly, hot Cheetos. It, that's what yeah. we got to get you. Huh, okay, well, definitely let John Elliott know that uh, I need yes. a pair of the jeans and we'll take it from there. We'll, we'll, we'll shoot maybe like a lookbook of me eating, you know, what, what else should I be eating? Well, maybe some kebab with my hands. Yeah, in those jeans. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at him. He's really, really going to the well with the, the lyrics today. I love it. Going yeah. deep. We should get to the giveaway. Oh, yeah. We have a pair of sneakers to give away. We should get to the giveaway because it's a special week. This week, Complex Land is happening. You guys, hopefully that you guys have been interacting with Complex Land. It started on Wednesday and Friday when this goes up is actually the last day. And there's a lot of great experiences to be had. And, and a lot of sneakers to awesome buy, too. Drops, yeah. A lot of sneakers to buy. So we hope you guys are enjoying that experience, Complex Land 2.0. Yeah, there's some really good drops that I'm sure are going to sell out very quickly. But uh, hopefully some surprises as well. Yeah, Joe, speaking of the eBay giveaway, we have a very fitting sneaker this week, given that you're in Miami. Yes, yes. I was here for this launch. Great sneaker, great dinner. Like Wealthy being surprised this morning, I went to a dinner for this relaunch and we all got pairs of these and we were surprised. So done, tell the audience what it is. We have here the linen Nike Air Force One. This is the Kith re-release. This is an iconic yes. colorway, really special shoe. A sneaker I wanted for so long, the original linen yeah. Air Force One. And then I was so hyped when Kith brought them back. 
a couple years ago. So this is that Miami exclusive release. It's just a beautiful sneaker, eBay authentication. Oops, whoa, looking a little Almost shaky. Almost fumbled it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, authenticity guarantee tag on there so you know it's legit. Yeah, just what, what a beautiful sneaker. That, that shoe flew under the radar, like, when it yeah. first came out, because you got it, and then the... Yeah, and I, I always say this, like, I'm not just making up these stories, but when they first came out, I ended up buying a pair on yeah. eBay, because there were a lot of them on eBay for relatively cheap, because I think Kith had a lot of them, mm -hmm. and I think people were just buying multiple pairs there, and so I got my pair on, on eBay a while back, and now we're happy to give away this and, pair to, to a and listener. And there was, like, special pairs, I think, Joe, probably from the dinner you, had, you were at that came with the Futura, Futura. box... Yes, I got yeah, that. Yeah, that clear acrylic box, right? In the mm -hmm. original release of that shoe, early 2000s, Japan only, mm -hmm. you know, I've heard stories about like Clark Kent flying out there to get the shoes. I think they only made them, up, I think he even said they only made them up to like a 12 or something like that. Like mm. they didn't even make a size 13 because it was a, a concept Japan release. So. Yeah, yeah. What a beautiful shoe. And, and just so people know how this works, each week we are giving away a sneaker here on the Complex Sneakers Podcast. Thanks to our friends at eBay. And basically, on Friday afternoon, we'll tweet out from the Complex Sneakers account a call for questions for people in the audience to ask us questions. We'll go through those questions, pick the best one. If we pick your question to read here on air, we will send you a free pair of sneakers from eBay's Authenticity Guarantee Program. Don't ask, like, what our favorite shoe is. Don't ask what sneaker we want to collaborate on. Don't ask... Um, uh, what's our favorite colorway of a certain sneaker? Also, don't DM us with questions <laughs> for this. Because so many people are like, oh, question for the pod. You, you, gotta, you, gotta, you have to go you, to the tweet. You, legally, you have to enter the yes, correct way. Or you're not going to get you. your answer read and win the sneakers by DMing me. Yeah, so all that said, that's how you enter. That's how you win a pair of sneakers. We're giving away a pair each week. This week, we're giving them to Bryce Connolly from Iowa. And Bryce asked our favorite complex con moment or drop. And I, I'm thinking maybe we keep this specifically to sneakers since that's what we're here to do. You guys have a moment or a sneaker release at complex con that really sticks out. I think I know mine. Yeah, I would say mine, even though there's been so many, I think for me, it's the NERD NMD. I think that was like a special release. And that was the year I did the kind of shopping with Clark Kent. And mm -hmm. early in the morning, we went around to all different stations and what? that year, for that drop, I was really happy to get a pair of those. Was that the one where like Pharrell was like chucking boost balls off like the top of the Adidas booth? Does that sound right? You, you know me, I get the I years know. mixed up, honestly. I get the years mixed up, it might have been. I, I remember Adidas too had a that our, our former coworker, Rich Mays Lopez, interviewed Pharrell, I think, yeah. at the Adidas booth. And it, was that also the activation where the Adidas booth, they had those crates? above above it where you could digitally scan yeah. them? Or was that yep. the next year? I, I, I think that was, wealthy. I think that was, I think that was, uh, I forget. I think that was the next year where they were trying to do like the safe drop offs because mm. the 2017, as we had mentioned, was just like uh, chaos madness. Yeah. yeah. I know that there was a Y3 model. There was a Y3 model that year, the NERD NMD released. Okay. I, and yeah, and I just remember there was like a bunch of models that in the morning Clark and I went to the booth and I was lucky enough to get a pair. But that, that would probably be mine. What about you guys? Welty, do you have a moment of madness that really sticks out? Maybe, maybe witnessing the diamond release going down. Which was 20, I, I 2018. 2018, okay. And then I think, I know we discussed it on this, but also hanging out with Brendan Dunn in front of the lobster truck because he thought he was going to be able to buy mm. a pair of the Concepts lobsters yep, off yep, the yep. menu. Yep. Uh, okay. That didn't pan out for me. That's one of my favorite moments. Um, I got to say, for me, it's that giant... Air Force One yeah. booth that mm -hmm. Nike had where you could make your yeah. own custom Air Force Ones, which I'm not that yes. into custom sneakers, but I don't really consider it a custom sneaker because it was something that Nike sanctioned. So you could go in there and they had all, you could you could get an X-Acto knife and, and take the swoosh off your shoe and then replace it. They had all these swooshes floating around. You could have them dip dye your sneakers and things like that. And I remember it was just yeah, so much fun running around the booth and trying to find the right swooshes to match different things on the medial and the lateral. And then the pair that I made that weekend, I, I was really happy with them. And then I had a friend who was working at Nike in Beaverton at the time. I sent him the shoes yep. and he made for me a custom tongue label for them that says Air Force wow. Dunn. And again, I don't, I don't like custom shoes, but to me, it's almost, it's almost like a yeah. PE or something, you that know, because Nike actually that made counts. it. So I, I really cherish that shoe. 
Wow, we need to see those or at least take a picture of them. I, I've never seen those. It's uh, well, I'll, I'll see if I can snap a photo and we can throw it in here. But yeah, one of the favorite sneakers I have in my collection. And I, that was just so much fun, the way Nike... I, and that was the same year that I think they did the Virgil Air Force One, yeah. the Rockefeller Air Force mm -hmm. One, which we'll Travis. talk about a little later. Travis Air Force One, all those Air Force Ones. That, was, that, was, that booth was amazing. I remember seeing... Skepta and like Sam Ross sitting there just yeah. designing their own Air Force Ones. Yeah. A lot of memories. And my favorite moment in general had to be 2016. Cuddy just popped up and walked the floor. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, I think you were, I think you were mentioning that. Was that the one that we were not there for? Well, yeah, the one that we weren't cool oh. enough. <laughs> okay, oh. sorry. Well, okay, yeah, I sorry. I remember hearing about it afterward. <laughs> Cuddy basically got in touch with us. It was like, yeah, I just want to come through the, the floor and like, he just showed up and walked, and it was like massive, massive crowd around him, and he must have walked around for like an hour. So that sticks out as an overall complex con moment, but the drop, yeah, I would have to say NERD, NMD. So. And we'll be back this year. Don't forget, in the fall. Yes, we will. Complex land this week, complex con in the fall. So Bryce Connolly, the Linen Air Force Ones are on their way to you. All right, now time for the guest of the week. Our guest on today's podcast changed the way sneaker marketing and storytelling was thought of in the 90s. In a time where Nike was fully focused on the athlete, he thought of ways to marry footwear with entertainment and add a jolt of pop culture into the sneaker scene. He worked at Nike for over 14 years and held positions of Eakin, led the early development of Nike sportswear, and then went on to become the first African-American global footwear product director in 1998. He then transitioned to the sports as a brand manager across multiple divisions. While holding those titles, he became the person behind some of Sneaker's biggest grails, like the original Rockefeller Air Force One and the insanely rare Wu-Tang Dunk. Although he had a long tenure at Nike, his work in the industry did not stop there. He went on to work in footwear at Ralph Lauren, Supra, and Under Armour. He's been a force in footwear during every era and continues to be a master in storytelling as part of his brand I Am agency. To talk some of the stories behind your favorite sneakers, we're excited to welcome Drew Greer to the Complex Sneakers podcast. Welcome, Drew. Thanks for having me. How are you, man? Can't complain. Man, this, this, this guy has so much history to yes. tell us. I, I feel like he's, Drew, your name, I mean, we've spoke years ago, but talking to all these people in the industry, it's like your name just pops up left and right. Yeah. All these like industry vets where it's like all roads lead back to Drew Greer in, in the limited edition sneaker game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also on this podcast, to be all honest. All the people who, who we say are the OGs or the originators of this stuff, they say Drew is the OG. So, so we want to talk about all that. But there, there, there are even people sort of before me. I was sort of the first sort of that was able to connect the culture and the sports piece. Mm -hmm. And it was more than a nine to five. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, when I used to do market travel, you know, we, you know, during the day we have, you know, extensive reps and retailers that I would connect with. But it was after hours, after five and connecting, you know, deeper with the culture. Me being an L.A. guy that I got a better understanding of kind of, you know, what the market wanted, you know, it wasn't my sort of creative force. I just sort of rep represented the buying power of the streets and you know, had an ear and listened. Yeah, you being an LA guy, Drew, can you tell us about before you got to Nike, just your childhood in LA and how important sneakers were to you growing up? Originally from Linwood Compton, um, dad's from Compton, mother's from Watts. Um, my inspiration just sort of, even was related to just sort of working at Nike, just, I was a football player. I played Division One football at Ohio University, but that sort of drove me. Um, but from a sneaker standpoint, it wasn't extensive um, as it was from a New York perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, we wore Chucks and Case we, we We had our flavors, but it wasn't at the same passion level or the open palette. From a retail standpoint, you know, most of our uh, shopping was 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 mall. Mm -hmm. You know, from a Foot Locker perspective, mm -hmm. not really moms and pops and sporting goods, where from an East Coast perspective, you guys are really developing the mom and pops. They were trying to differentiate themselves from the national guys. So they would take risk on more colors and you know buying more of the assortment where in LA was much more narrower. Um, and then the other thing is just the currency, just like graffiti culture. I mean, it was a currency from a sneaker standpoint and the exposure that kids got on the train and you know Manhattan being epicenter. This is sort of what I've I've taken from my years of sort of study in the market. It just seems it was just on a whole nother level. You know, from our from a West Coast perspective, it was more car culture. Right. Not that we mm. didn't wear sneakers, but we just didn't have the options. And, you know, 
our cars did a much greater sort of statement with us um, than than from a sneaker standpoint, but we still had it. It just wasn't as extensive. Yeah. And then uh, from an athletic standpoint, although we had the Lakers and UCLA, it was a football state. I mean, we're actually good in all sports, but football was sort of the, the, the driving force. Of recent, we've really placed a lot of athletes in the NBA, and it, it's really increased. We've had a incredible run in, in the 2000s from a basketball perspective mm-hmm. but w- we didn't have the passion like new york has from you know from the knicks to st john's and you know syracuse mm-hmm. right, to right, right. you know ruckers and then you know now dykeman and you know west forth and so the rest of it so that that made it a little bit different from particularly when you start talking about the air force one and the dunk and some of those those iconic products that 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 were adopted not only from New York but just the Northeast. Yeah, but but Drew, when you when you first got to Nike in 1994, you started out as an Eakin, and these are people who are obsessed with the product and who can tell the retailers and the consumer kind of everything about the product. So how did you get to that level to where you were kind of a master of product and Nike trusted you to do that? Um, I was actually a new breed of Eakin, so to speak, because typically it was very running driven. Mm-hmm. Um, right. um, you know, they weren't going into the hoods, particularly from an L.A. standpoint, maybe from a New York standpoint, but not from an L.A. standpoint. So I sort of broke the mold um, um, from a perspective. But for me, it was a, just a great opportunity to really learn about the brand, learn about the products. You know, working in Southern California, you, can, you know, I went from Orange County to RSGs to the hood. So the diversity and the training and the understanding I got, you know, you're in I, the IE versus Orange Close Plaza versus Fox Hills Mall, and the difference of the demands of the consumer were from a New York standpoint. Everything was pretty much centralized. You know, mm-hmm. hip hop drove everything. You know, it was just sort of this love of basketball, sort of all the way around, where there, there was a much different appetite um, from from a Southern California sort of standpoint. What but sneakers still did people certain- want in that, in that zone? I mean, we wore Chucks and K Swiss, and you but know, from a Nike like standpoint, like what what models were big that you were trying to push at that moment? Talking about when I was in Eakin? yeah, um, pretty much the same thing, but it was a simpler palette. You know, mm-hmm. white, white, white navy. You know, possibly sort of black. It wasn't as open, particularly because the really wasn't the apparel there to sort of hook it up at the time. Okay. You know, I hate sort of the granimal sort of approach where New York had that ability as well as just the Caribbean base and, you know, some of the other things make it much more sort of flamboyant. So it was pretty basic. I mean, Air Force Ones, when I were Eakin, were on the bottom shelves in Foot Locker. And you know what that means. You know, that, yeah. that, that wasn't a product that was in demand. I, like there was Tony Sports in Inglewood that was one of my accounts. And I was, you know, I couldn't understand why he wouldn't take a risk on Air Force Ones and some of the other products to differentiate themselves so you didn't have the same thing as Foot Lockers for those kids that really wanted it or the the entertainment folks that were sort of visiting, you know, the, he, he could have been that source of more than mom and pops, but they, they didn't have that aggressive mentality that they had on um, from an East Coast perspective, from a, from a retail standpoint. Drew, how early on did you identify as the Air Force One going to be like the biggest shoe? Because it seems like you were very, very early on it. You just talked about how it was on the bottom shelf when you saw it, and then you really kind of adopted the Air Force One and built so many projects around it. So that was, we were speaking when I was at Eakin. When I took over from a a then called limited edition sort of standpoint, um, you know, it was very Northeast driven. It wasn't a West Coast Mm -hmm. sort of deal, but the internet, hip hop lyrics, you know, a lot of things played in sort of educating the rest of the country. I'm pre-internet, so things weren't as mm-hmm. sort of homogenous. So, you know, now you can just sort of go online and, you know, music videos started to give a hint of sort of what was going on in the other markets. But uh, it wasn't really to the internet p- post me that it really started taking off. We just controlled distribution, so it sold out. So we gr- we grew it over time properly versus overselling, which a lot of the brands do now. They get ahead. They don't have inline product that 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 can you know um, take up shelf space, so their classics become sort of their mainstay. So they oversell them, they come back. Where Nike had the ability to you know we treated it like dessert; it wasn't a main course meal. So a combination of 
us growing it properly, as well as um, the exposure and it's sort of growing, then it changed. You know what I mean? It used to be a different business. You know, it, it became more of a restaurant business where, you know, your mainstay is your Big Mac, which is your stable. And then you have your seasonal, you know, mm -hmm. uh, product, your eggnog lattes from a Starbucks standpoint, where that kind of reversed, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with sort of the, class, the, the whole industry change. You know, the, you know, the deal was about innovation every 90 days, sort of, in, you know, reinventing yourself versus the, the culture you know, one of these, 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 these classic products, but you can't overshift and that just become what your brand's about. Because again, you oversell, you can't really, oh, you can't really storytell, you know, become sort of basic versus you got to keep it innovating for the future. A lot of the products that are hot now didn't even sell when they originally came out, including some of the, 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 the Jordan, so to speak, even the original, if you go back to the original Jordan, the ones they, they were on sale on the West coast at mm -hmm. one point. That's why a lot of the skater kids, jumped on it because they could get them on sale at a yep. Oshman Sporting Goods and, you know, yeah. and they were open to the, to the uh, extravagant colors, you know, they, that were considered sort of aggressive at the, at the time. Again, that, 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 that palette, I mean, that, you know, you don't mind me jumping into it, but that, that's kind of what happened with the, um, the Iowa, the Iowa dunk. Mm -hmm. I re-released the Nike dunks, sold it at Foot Locker. They gorged at the time, booked, you know, approximately like 50,000 pair. The market wasn't ready for it um, with the original colors, so it sat. So then I knew I ate one. I had, this was January, this was February. So ate one that year. I knew I had the Iowa coming, and that was an aggressive color, and I was just What year is this? is this? Is this 98 or 99? Sorry. Dude, I'm so old. <laughs> you guys tell me, man. Like, I think the dunk you know what I mean? Like, 98, 98. Yes. Yeah, 98, 98 or 99. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Go on, Drew. So um, I was in the office of Loud Records dealing with a buddy of mine, Comb Contrell. You know, I'm trying to, you know, not trying to sell products, but like trying to find ways to, t you know, tell stories. There was no internet. So my products just sh mm -hmm. showed up. You know, if you're lucky enough and, you know, you worked at retail, possibly the buyer or the, the owner would, would allow the kids to know what's going in. Or if I came in with my money bag, because I used to travel the country with a you know, suitcase with samples, you know, getting no internet and not driven by influencers. So you know, that's how I got educated on what's going out. So I'm in loud records often and we're trying to figure out, you know, just building just, you know, they had the street team at the time, Steve Rifkin and them. Mm -hmm. And Comb and I were mm -hmm. just building and you know, Comb just came up and was like, yo, we should do a Wu-Tang. You know, we yeah. should we should do a Wu Tang dunk, and I was like, "Yo, I got the Iowa colors match." You know, it just made it, it just made sort of you know perfect sense, but it, it wasn't a retail deal. Again, it was it was something where we we did a hundred pair. They they kept fifty, I kept fifty. We seeded again, no internet, and it became bigger than what it actually was, just from a from a storyteller point. But that sort of kicked things off, and a lot of people didn't know either. You knew, you knew that that was the currency mm -hmm. back then, sort of word of mouth versus um, from from an internet sort of perspective. How, how did you how did you actually get the shoes made? Because obviously I'm guessing that Nike didn't know that you were getting the, the product made. So how did you like <laughs> go to the factory and you're like etch the Wu-Tang logo on, on the heel of the dunk and then send me back a hundred pairs? So, the, you know, Nike's so big, they weren't micromanaging them. When I was ha handling sportswear, I, it was a side business. Mm -hmm. I could do anything I want to the most part. You know what I mean? I didn't care. Just show up and have an assortment and make sure that the North e Northeast reps are happy, so to speak. Um, so I got approval. I, 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 no, I got loud to give me a, a notary, give me approval to use the logo. So I, I covered myself. And I just had a developer. We just spun it. We took the artwork, spun it, uh, came back, shipped them to loud. They went crazy. Got the sample, you know, got the actual pairs, ordered the pairs, and then we split them up, and you know, the rest is history. How how do you feel now, though, seeing and I don't know quite off the top, but like guessing that a shoe like that is worth like fifty thousand dollars, right? If you can get like a dead stock pair of them, like is that crazy to you that those items that you created have become like these things of like archival legend in sneakers? Um. Understanding the passion and seeing the fire take off, 
I, I can understand it. Not necessarily my my sort of deal. You know, you're I, not going to pay fifty thousand for it. I mean, I, I, I didn't collect football cards. I played. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, That's sort of my not mentality. It, not I'm not it. standing in line. Okay. You know what I mean? Not, I'm not trying to come off arrogant. I came from the athlete side that had the culture piece. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And things went on. Things morphed and different people sort of carried the roles. And I think it aligns with where the business had. But I, I was sort of perfect. You know what I mean? Like I took the risks with the Wu-Tang where the prior – people that are, are individuals that held my role were great people and did great things in Nike. They just couldn't understand the culture or knew when to take risk or knew what made sense. I, I you know, Cone wasn't the only one that sort of came with me with ideas and, you know, different ideas we could do a product. My role was to, you know, figure out which ones were the right ones. Mm-hmm. Were there, were there any How shoes like that that didn't happen kind of in the Wu Tang Rockefeller lane, like any other artists of that stature who wanted to do a Nike, who you had to shut it down? No, I mean, it, it, it was limited. I did Rockefeller that I did me and Udi sort yeah. of bridge that sort of situation, but I got written up, you know, our, our Hollywood promo yeah. department, they weren't aggressive. They were conservative and they were more concerned about, okay, we're going to open up a can of worms. Cause if I do it for Wu Tang, then all the other artists are going to come in and want to do it Mm -hmm. versus, you know, it being a way to, you know, start to ignite sportswear, you know, because you didn't have the internet to tell stories product just showed up and I missed that a bit. And it also killed the, the currency of the sales associates because they used to know what was coming in, you know, they they had the ends. Now, you you know, there's no anticipation. I wish now stuff would just, if I were brands, Stuff would just show up. You know what I mean? If it's online or in store, I would do things that just sort of show up just to create, you know, a, a, a frenzy, kind of like the, the, the Beyonce album. <laughs> mm, got it. Drew, did you have any conversations with Wu Tang members about that dunk, like either years later or when it happened? And did you ever, yeah, chop it up with them? And did they ever, like, realize how rare it was? Actually, no. That was a distant deal. Okay. And I, I was, you know, I, I was just trying to get it, you know, get it done. And I had a contact as well as I was playing with fire a little bit. You know, Nike was very okay. territorial as it related to the entertainment. They didn't want us talking on them. You know, that's the entertainment where they wanted to sort of put in Got some it. ways I sort of understand, but other ways as we see things have grown now from a cultural standpoint and they didn't have the, 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 the team members that could sort of really connect that. To the complete standpoint, they might have known the culture, but they didn't know the internal workings or how to sort of get things sort of done completely. Um, but but no, I had I, I can't take credit as it relates to having interaction. It was all brokered through Comb Contrail from a loud record standpoint and work with Steve Rifkin. And then Udi, who's, you know, who, who works quite a, a legend, has work yeah. legend yes. quite a bit. And I'll be honest with you, like those guys educated me. I, you know, I'm not coming in like, like I listen to Sales Associates. I, I, I built my network of, of folks within the, within the individual cities. But the beauty of sneaker retail, or particularly New York retail, those cats were on the floor. Mm-hmm. You know, they weren't looking at Excel sheets. You know what I mean? They were they in the taste, field. You know, they were in the field. You know what I mean? Versus now, it's it, everything is analytical. And I'm not, I'm not the bitter old dude. I'm not cool hurt. But um, it was just, it's just a different atmosphere. I wrote an article on it. Just you miss that a little bit. I just wish that the the um, particularly from a what what we call urban standpoint, I wish more of those accounts were were, were reserved because they did so much to kick start to get the boutique situation sort of kicked off, which you know which Nike wasn't ready for when 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 it was was first introduced from a from a, a Bobito standpoint in Footworks. Mm-hmm. Nike didn't have the infrastructure, plus Bobito was all over the place and he really couldn't put it his buys and get things organized. But he was sort of ahead of his time. It wasn't until the woven and A Life that, you know, the brand started, started to understand the team it or there was a structure. Understand like it isn't about selling, you know, a bunch of pair. This is a bit this is planning to see. Mm. Um even the ret- even the retailers didn't understand. I used to talk to Jaime at at at, um, at Transit. I was like, dude, why don't you open up a boutique so at least you know what's coming? You know what I mean? Even if you don't want the business, but you get upset when you know they're they're doing all these drops with folks that don't have to buy product that isn't going to sell. Well, you need to open up a boutique. But they were so stuck in the 
Dr. J's huge square right. footage, you know, looking big at the doors, money yeah. versus right, big doors versus seeing where the the, the market was headed. Nobody knew again that the internet was going to take off, you know, because originally it was just communication. Then it became underground, um, you know, eBay from a selling sort of standpoint. And then, it became, you know, then the consumer started sort of to connect and then things just sort of took off. And that's where we are, or, are today. Drew, I just want to go back real quick. I know we had spoke about it in the past, but for our for our listeners, I kind of want you to explain the story about how the Rockefeller Air Force One happened. I know you mentioned Udi. For those who don't know, Udi Avashalom, he was like the, he used to run a store called Training Camp in New York. I believe he's like VP of footwear or something at Yeezy. Yeah, high up at Yeezy right now. Yeezy right now um, out in Wyoming. But you connect with him to, to make the Rockefeller Air Force Ones. You originally did it in a bunch of different colors, but then you decide on making the all-white yeah, yeah. Air Force One with the Rockefeller logo on the heel. Can you just I, I didn't decide. I actually did like a white, black, and I think a white navy. And Jay was like, I don't even wear white, white. You know what I mean? What are you doing? Uh, Jay-Z uh, told you uh, white on white is the only. Not me. That came through through yeah. Udi. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Udi had those contacts. Okay. Again, there was no way I wanted to be, you know, I was trying to do it very underground, so to speak. Um, and um, finally got it right. Got the pairs. Jay got his, and, and he went into to, 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 uh, Cohen's office and, and put his foot up on the door. and was like, yo, you ain't got none of these. And <laughs> he went Cohen. irate. Obviously, you know, Leo Cohen, yes, yeah. went, went irate. Um, called the head of entertainment. So um, Leo Cohen calls up Nike because he, he didn't authorize the shoe. Or, yeah, because Jay-Z. You would kind of you know set it I mean? up. They yeah. were mad, Jay-Z. Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And then as you see the documentary, some of the things go on. Think about when he did the Def Jam. He did the Rockefeller. Yeah. Or he gave Death a bunch of, the of people a Def Jam. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in, in, um, in Rockefeller Def Jam jackets. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. He felt mm -hmm. like, because they were the parent sort of company. So he called in. And um, I had already got a warning for... <sighs> The Wu Tang, so I got actually written up, right. but it was just like I got to go through the motions. You're good, but I got to sort of at least sort of write you up and do. I, I still got a bonus that year. Put it that way. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's important. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that 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 was sort of that, that sort of interrupted, but it, it was it was a fun time. But it was also wild that I had so much control. You know what I mean? Like just think that I was the deciding factor. Management at Nike didn't really care after we started creating incredible buzz. Mark Parker started, I hated Oregon, so I wanted to get out and I wanted to get on the brand side, but he started bringing his people in to take over because I was the head of the sales meetings, you know, from the storytelling and, you know, the, the, the I was making videos and just, you know, really living the culture versus, you know, it was just sort of very athletic, you know, very, and that's what the brand is about, but yeah, got to sort of balance the storytelling and what's really going on. And most of the folk, I was the source because there was no internet. So most of the company designers, product people, they weren't in the market. You know what yeah. I mean? And our, our trend committee, we didn't have the, the 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 personnel that was comfortable doing it. So I was coming back with all the insights. It could be magazines, stories, samples, whatever. I was sort of the go-to because it, the company wasn't sort of set up at the, at the time to really penetrate. And that's globally. Mm -hmm. and initially, a sort of, as you talk about the growth, you know, took over the I-95 and then, you know, in, in Chicago and eventually start developing products specifically for the West Coast. But then, you know, connecting in, you know, in Japan. Um, first makeup in Japan, we took a dunk in Laker colors. And because they were worried about minimums, we did purple gold and gold purple. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Boom yeah. magazine, sort of. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys remember that. That yeah, was like yeah, one of, of course, the original of sort of sort of sneaker deal, and you know they sort of publicized it. But th that lets you know kind of how it was sort of a crawl, and then it just sort of took off like you know everybody's a sneakerhead now. Well, that wasn't the case. Yeah. You know, New York was educated. You guys were were were, were it. The thing I struggle with now as well is there's no hunt, like. If you really wanted it, you had to go to the Yeah, <laughs> you had to fly to Japan <laughs> you know or something I mean? like that. Right. And, right. And, 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 you know, not being sort of racial, but that's what I had mad respects for the skate kids and the punk kids yeah. in New York, you know, that weren't from those backgrounds. They were hungry and got it and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and wanted it. You know what I mean? It was this different deal. You know, it's like I sort of balked at when they 
because originally the the Nike Sportswear store I was living in in Amsterdam at the time, working out of there. But originally the Nike Sportswear store was supposed to be um, was supposed to be Air Force One store. Right, Twenty One Mercer, and the original the, concept. Was yeah, to and, be yeah, all and then they Air put Force it downtown. And I'm just like, why are you putting it downtown? Why don't you put it mm. in? Yeah. In Harlem, you know, but they were so worried about interrupting Foot Locker and, 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 and the rest of the accounts um, versus to me doing what's sort of right, you know, kind of culture vulture, so to speak. And they, they and they were taking the, the page out of you because remember in Japan, everything, you know, Dunk sold next yeah. to Red Wings, next to yeah. Prada, you know what I mean? It was kind of that setting. And they, they they sort of mirrored that, you know. But again, that aligned with kind of where things sort of headed. I just hate it hate the fact that your urban environments are you know the backs are sort of getting turned and it's all national guys there for the most part and yeah you know guys where the where the where the business was really built um there's, there's less representation from a from a from a mom and pop perspective. there's no bodega sneaker store so yeah. to speak yeah, not, right. not bodega the actual sneaker <laughs> right store, <but laughs> that level of, yeah. store. you know what i mean like i just think there's something there that everybody wins yeah Drew, you mentioned briefly Air Force Ones and kind of, again, that idea that 21 Mercer, the original idea, was it for it to be an all Air Force One store. And I know the Air Force One was probably a huge part of the business when you were there. Do you remember the impact that, that Nelly had on the Air Force One and, and how big that song was on the shoe? Because like people debated on the internet whether or yeah. not Nelly had like a, a real effect on sales of Air Force Ones. Was that a turning point for you? Do you remember what that was I like internally? I had transferred Nike? out from a branding standpoint, but I have to admit I cringe. You cringed? I cringe, why? yeah. You, you, why? yeah I'm why? just thought that he wasn't a New York dude. It okay. Was a super bubbly song. Okay. You know what I mean? It, it just, wasn't. It wasn't it what you knew lie. about the Air yeah. Force One. It was something different. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's like a you know a Brady Bunch collaboration. Like cut it out. <laughs> you know, not that bad. But you, you, it just didn't align. I just I'm super authentic. Yes. Yeah. Like even you guys. I just read the article you guys did on the Puerto Rican. Yeah. Um, Air Force One. You know, we launched that in Spanish Harlem. Yeah. You know what I mean? First then gave it to the rest of the city. I mean, those are the sort of details that I was about. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was a collective team as related to that, Mike Parker and others. Um, Mike drove it, but those were the sort of, you know, things that I'm into. You know, Mike put a co on it so that it was real where, you know, some of the other brands came out and they just put the flag on it. They were just, you know, jumping on it, you know, just trying to sell some shoes where we were trying to develop an emotional connection with a product that was already, you know, that was, we could probably sold that color in that same colorway, but adding, you know, that additional storytelling. We even went as far as, um, you know, I, I think we'd get in trouble now and, and me being a little bit more uh, mature from a, a brand standpoint, but there was even a Puerto Rican day Air Force One float. <laughs> So, Believe it or not, like, really, it was a, it was a, it's yeah. a shoe. So there's photos or there's something out there. It was in the it was the actual shoe. It's an actual shoe. Wow, yeah. I never Nike knew. would never do that today, like the shoe car, but it was fun. <laughs> uh, Drew, I assume part of the reason those things were so important to you was because there probably weren't a lot of people who looked like you in those positions at the time. Did it feel like you were the only black man who was kind of able to to have this power to create product at Nike like that at the time? I mean, to be honest with you, to be pure, like it really should have been somebody from the Northeast, but I was privileged to get the opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. imagine being an LA kid. In some ways, I think it was good because I was really listening and I wasn't a know-it-all. Yeah. But just going on these voyages, I, I've written articles on it, just like going on these market travel voyages. And, you know, I mean, it's just incredible, you know, taking notes and, you know, buying things and, you know, getting the history. And Like my first trip to New York, I'm in the, the, the Hilton in Times Square. Mm -hmm. Uh, entertainment market that time hooked me up. MC Search and I spent five hours, and he was just putting me on game. Mm -hmm. And I had to connect because you know I love sneakers and ball and all of that. And I don't know if you ever had time with Search; he'll talk your head off. Yeah, sure. But he was like, you know, my deal was I had those throughout the Northeast, and that sort of led me at my curiosity. You know what I mean? What was going on and how to get out of it. the big allocation piece? Because before I got there, you know, I had partner in crime from the sales side, this cat Jerry and Laco. Like we were yep. the two cats that were really digging. Like, you know, Sam Siegel, I don't know if you know yeah. him. He's like the godfather, but he did the downfield blocking. But Jerry and I were really the two man 
show that would go around the country and connecting with retailers. But I was walking on Fulton Street and they were like, all these products that we call limited edition were, you know, being sold in jewelry stores. Like, mm-hmm. like I was like, what's going, you know, what's going on here? And that's when we, we changed um, the allocation strategy and wanted to see sell through numbers. 80% sell through in a month or you bought too much mm. was kind of the strategy then. You know, we had to repurpose it because if not, you know, you, you kill the product and, it, it, you know, you create demand. And I think it proves that that strategy in building instead of, you know, if you sell out instead of, you know, increasing it, you know, uh, you know, 80 percent, increasing the, the, the next year's production to maybe, you know, 20 or 30. I think over the long haul, obviously, you got to enhance storytelling and, you know, still have great product and the rest of that. It, you can build a business out of it. And now Air Force One is the number one selling fuel in the industry. Air, Foot Locker used to have the ability to buy yeah. as many white whites as they want any time of the year. How many were they buying? Um, I can't remember what the, the, the exact things, but like one of the, one of the like revolutionary strategies that we put in place was we didn't sell Air Force Ones one, one holiday season. Let's take it off so the market. Yeah. We didn't even, we didn't offer any, you know what I mean? It was just part of drying up the process, like went in a presentation and, and that led to me being able to, because there was hesitation to re-release the Max 95, the, um, the uh, trainer SC, mm-hmm. and then we started getting more aggressive, bringing more models. Because before it was just Air Force One and the Max SC. In Europe, they had the the, the Max BW, yeah. mm-hmm. but yep. just pounding over and over, and they seeing what the demand was able to open up molds because that was like a no no then. People were scared, like you know, you know, you got to do fifty thousand if you, you open up a mold, not realizing what. What, what, what the culture was out there. Jesse Leva, actually, we had him on here recently, and he told this story of you going to one of those presentations and, and basically people are giving, you know, detailed breakdowns about the products they want to bring to the market and things like that. And you, Drew, just said, cut the lights and they threw on some Jay-Z and you were just holding up different shoes in different colorways <laughs> that you guys yeah. had just gone crazy on. Do you remember that moment? I think what it was a- in Houston. No, one of my legend it was, it was Palm Springs. Palm Springs, and okay. it sucked because it was hot. There were flies everywhere. <laughs> it was a mess. But uh, the presentation strategy was I didn't even speak to any of the shoes. I just pulled because I used to, you know, pulled stuff out of the bag. Mm-hmm. And they just sort of went crazy as I pulled out sort of the assortment with, with, with sort of music there. That, I mean, that was even part of sort of the break. And it seems doesn't seem revolutionary now. It was, I was the first cat bringing beats to presentations right. at, at night. Explicitly yeah. connecting you know I mean? these cultures. To create the mold. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And then I'm getting early, you know, early, early releases or instrumentals, obviously, um, early because I had connections within the record label to set the tone and get the reps because it was an education process. Not only educating the reps, but educating the company as a whole. You know, after I go out on these ventures, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning more and more stories. And I got better at sort of story because before, I'll be honest, I was just. I was just coloring up shoes. Okay, we'll do a white, white, we'll do that. Right. But then, you know, you get further, you get more sophisticated in telling stories and understanding the importance. You know what I mean? So, because even part of word of mouth, the storytelling, you know, instead of the right, white, red Air Force, if there's a story behind it, you know, it sort of elevates the, the, the cachet. Yeah. True. You mentioned in past interviews that when you got to Nike, there wasn't really an LA person to kind of build storytelling around. And then, you get to work with Kobe Bryant and you work with him closely and, and you did the, you know, talk about like the Aston Martin, him jumping over the Aston Martin and working with an athlete who it was like, you got your LA guy being from LA. Yeah. From an LA stand, we never had anybody even from a, really from a sneaker standpoint, say mm-hmm. Bo Jackson, so to speak, Kareem a little bit, you know, Magic a little bit with weapons, but, you know, yeah. Kobe was the, the great opportunity. I was actually working in L.A. from an uh, L.A. regional sort of standpoint. And All-Star was that, was all, was that year. We signed Kobe. I, I was ecstatic. And then um, mm-hmm. Colorado happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just unfortunate. So everything got kind of put on hold. And I, I'm going to get to uh, the, the Aston Martins. Everything got kind of put on hold. 
So then I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm banging, you know, Mark Parker, like, yo, know, when can we, when, when can we touch Kobe? When can we, you know, so to touch Kobe? So finally, we, we we did it loosely, but I developed a grassroots strategy. We connected Kobe with the hood first. We knew that all that he went through, that L.A. Laker fans, particularly in the hood, would be sort of the most forgiving. We had Kobe in barbershops, in Fox Hills Mall, at Westchester uh, basketball, Westchester High School basketball games, watching you know Trevor Ariza play, just you know East L.A. things he had never really done because he was just so focused on basketball and sort of disconnected. And Adidas really didn't engage that much from a from a, a storytelling in L.A. sort of standpoint. So, um, and then his jersey ended up being the number one sort of selling jersey in 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 the um, in the world. So then I moved to Amsterdam. Then I ended up taking the uh, head of LA, I mean, excuse me, U.S. basketball position in in Portland after coming back from Amsterdam, and trying to figure out a way. Kobe had a new shoe. Trying to figure out a way to. It really was the advertising team. Like, how do we exaggerate with not having any budget because basketball wasn't doing well at the time? We mm-hmm. just signed LeBron. We had all these athletes, and the digital team came up with the strategy of you know having him jump over a car to show the exaggeration of the shoe and, you know, the rest is sort of, sort of history, but it was integrated team, but really driven by, 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 by our digital team. Do you, do you remember the moment of him going to uh, undefeated in the DeLorean for the Nike mag inspired shoe? I was not there. Eddie Cruz and James yeah. Bond and those guys sort of drove that, but I haven't done that. Christian, I think Christian Parks, was responsible for that, but I, I was not there for that. I had, I didn't have that. That wasn't part of my sort of responsibilities. I had a shorty then, so probably uh, <laughs> didn't make it. But yeah, that was uh, he was a busy that was man. Quite, that was quite special. But that was the beginning of actually taking performance pro- product and taking it in that channel. I don't know if you remember the limited edition T-shirt that was sort of packaged up. They, they did some fun things earlier on. The billboard that used to be above. Um, Above, um, above undefeated, undefeated, right? Yeah, right there at the undefeated, time. Yeah. And then also another you know, breakthrough at the time, because this was part of building, because it really wasn't the sneaker culture in L.A., particularly outside of the urban neighborhood, again, limited palette. But even L.A. skate kids, they, didn't, they weren't really wearing dunk like New York kids. The L.A. skate kid is Orange County kid. They were surf base. You know what I mean? Lightning bolt, OP, vans till they, they, they sort of die. But during that era, um, we had the Blue House. I don't know if you guys ever heard that. We had a creative space on Venice yes, Beach. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. That Jim Morrison um, used to live in. It was one of my other sort of concepts. Um, we had that sort of house there. And we used that to bring all of the different dynamics from Hollywood to the hood to skate community to the, you know, uh, Aaron Rose, like bringing all the cartoon. And that really is what took off um, from a from an LA sneaker culture standpoint. And then uh, Undefeated was obviously there, and then others started sort of popping up. And then all of a sudden, you know, LA everybody sort of became a connector, a, a sneaker collector. But that wasn't there before. That was very East Coast based prior to um, the work that we put in in the in the early 2000s in LA in bringing the, what I call the different tribes together um, and 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 presenting the brand in a in an L.A. sort of way, you know, because typically when Nike wanted to do stuff sort of urban or edge, it was always basketball and very northeast. Yeah. Were, were there any unexpected Hollywood names that came through that Blue House space that you were not anticipating oh, being it was, sneakers? It, it, was, <laughs> um, it wasn't even just driven through sneakers, dude. We, were, we, we, we had some pretty dope experiences, you know, that, 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 that I mean... You name it, they were there. Ashton Kuzi, like it was. Just, it was just outrageous. The, Paris the, the Hilton, of, huh? Paris Hilton, you know, AM, like, the, like mm. it was just ridiculous. I mean, midweek being able to have that sort of experience on the water, you know, LA really never experienced. You know, New York, you guys have some pretty, you know, crazy experiences. A pretty, you know, not that LA doesn't that doesn't have edge, but we had the license to do some pretty pretty interesting thing and it wasn't just you know partying but we used to have build outs like we cut the roof open and mr cartoon put the, the ice cream truck in the middle and put the roof back on like there was some stuff that was, was mind changing or all-star weekend our, you know you know la closes 
our event, I won't call it party, didn't start till <laughs> two in the morning. You can't call it a party? <laughs> wow. I won't call it, call it an experience. Okay. Our experience didn't start till, till two in the morning. So we served chicken and waffles in, you know, had Biz Markie, you know, on, on the ones and twos. Incredible. Biz was dope. Biz was, Biz, Biz was, 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 had some pretty dope sessions in there. Was he a big Nike guy? The Safari was the big piece, yeah. the big push there, just right. him being on the album with that. Yes, 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 that, of that, that, that yeah, old, it's the shoes. Hold it. But yeah, but he's, he's one, he was one of the original cats, you know what I mean? Like, Biz is, you know, bless his, uh, you know, he, he's, he's having challenges from a health standpoint. Yeah. But Biz was from Long Island, but he traveled, from my understanding, again, I wasn't there during that era, but he traveled, you know, he was good in all boroughs, mm -hmm. so to speak. And he was one of the early ones making money and, put, you know, he put Big Daddy Kane down and, you know, helped others get checks. So he had early money, you know, kind of like Clark Kent. Right. True. From the early on, you realize that entertainers have a ton of influence, even at when brands focused on the athlete. How do you feel about like seeing now with like what Kanye West is doing and Travis Scott, where that's kind of the drum you were beating from your time at Nike? Um, I struggled. There was no way that I'm being honest with you that I thought Kanye was going to have the success he had. But their crew was really the first internet influencer crew. So there was right. a different voice. The athlete could do it on the court, on the field. Mm -hmm. They were the voice where, you know, music video, that sort of dated where I think the internet and the sort of social media allowed that to happen. You know, I cringed that, you know, the G units and Jay's Reebok deal like that that just wasn't really me. Like, was that just because you were like, a Nike guy or just you, no you I just didn't feel like the product just, I'm a on pure you know what I mean like I'm I'm, I'm a but I'm a pure guy I, I even hesitated on the internet you know what I mean I, I was like there's no way people are gonna be writing blogs and posting <laughs> nobody wants to write <laughs> typos but Drew and, not know, even Jay-Z Reebok Jay-Z Reebok not I mean come no on go? to knock off the Gucci that's that's corny to me. That's Jay. Said if you upset, then sue. You know what I mean? It's kind of like Ali Ashkenaz <laughs> said. Did like, we don't want to be the urban Gucci. We want to be the Gucci Gucci. You know what okay. I mean? Like, I think that's why I struggle with. I stopped wearing the, the a lot of the urban brands product because I want. You know, I, I'm in the black own, but be the best denim mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. not. A black denim company, be the blessed or, or have a different angle, waterproof, bulletproof, something to give, you know, from that story telling standpoint, and then you happen to be the other. And I just thought Jay, those, those guys could have, it's just, I mean, I get it, get that check, you know what I mean? Do, do, do what you got to do, but is there a way that that could have been done a little bit more sophisticated? Definitely not knocking something off. And you, Reebok let him do that with their brand. Do you feel like, do you feel it's like- It's kind of, go quickly. It's even like Under Armour with um, ASAP. You mm -hmm. let ASAP, Rocky do that with like knock off another shoe. Like, you weren't feeling it? On, yeah, the Osiris. Huh? The Osiris. Uh, yeah, but I'm saying, well, yeah, the Osiris. But I'm saying, come if you're at least going to do it, come with something fresh and new, not an interpretation of something else. Do you feel like when he was doing the Reebok stuff and then they were doing the G-Unit stuff, do you feel like they were kind of like, ripping off the stuff that you had done with Nike, putting like the logos on the heels, kind of like trying to recreate the shoes a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely saw the, I mean, again, they saw the all, blueprint. You know, right, you know, you know what I'm saying? Run DMC did it, but, right, Run DMC <laughs> just got, the, they were Run DMC, they didn't see product, they just had product for themselves. And I don't even mm -hmm. know if early on they even had their logo on it, but they did, they just got it. I took it to the phase of, okay, we're gonna seed it to friends and family. You know, we you know we're gonna sort of see that out sort of from an influencer standpoint. They took it from a to a, to a, to a sort of commercial level, no story, and you know they, they took the opportunity and, and and Reebok didn't have much going then, so they they seized the opportunity. You know the face narrative that they sold out and they did, dude. Sell, selling out is is realistic of what the pairs are. If you sell a hundred, you, you you sell ninety, and it's ninety percent. That's much different than selling. 10,000. Drew, how'd you feel when the Rockefeller Air Force One re-released a few years back? I'm like, I got written up for that. I can't get some, yeah. some <laughs> freaking flyer miles or something. It's just funny <laughs> right. how things, <laughs> funny how, how, how things, um, how change, you know, they, they change and makes me feel good that I, you know, I, I took the risk, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
be interesting to see that the Wu Tang, I think, could even be even bigger just because of their following internationally and from a skate if they were sort of the to re release that. But, um, it, it, you know, I knew I did the right thing, but it, it even confirmed that they had to sort of so, sort of say it, so to speak. And Drew, you you kind of glossed over his name real quick Ali Asho Workamore, um, founder of Alphanumeric. Alphanumeric Dunks, one of the very early on Pro B collaborations. Didn't you kind of have a hand in making that shoe, the Lightning Dunk? Yes, yes. So um, I'm originally from Compton and um, Linwood from an LA standpoint, but I went to high school in IE, which is a very skate sort of sort of community. But hooked up with Ali at, at, at the shows. Actually, he was working at Mecca, <laughs> believe yeah. it or not, um, at the time. And we just sort of connected. And I was just sort of blown away that he was one of the original Fat Farm designers, but yep. he was a skate kid. And then he started Alpha Numeric, which was before its time. Yep. Um, it, it, it just so missed the boat. And it was just sort of the same thing, like like um, the Wu-Tang and the Alpha Numeric. Ali and I were building. He's like, yo, we should do a dunk. I always felt before Sandy Brodecker and the rest of those cats got after SB, and understanding New York and its skate culture, I felt there was an opportunity there that, you know, you take the the Jordan one and some dunks and, you know, find some way to sell it in that channel and you know, apply storytelling as related to that. We could ignite being able to, you know, connect with that consumer because, you know, Nike had tried several times to get in skate and it was right. just... Oof, you know, Big misses. Uh, yeah. Asymmetrical, the cho, lacy, yeah, the you know, sh- skate shoes. <laughs> what was like, that one? The cho- come on, the, like you're the overthinking or something this. Yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, like you're, you're really overthinking. And then they had, you know, eventually uh, Xavier, Xavier mm-hmm. sort of yep. came yes. later on. Yep. But, yep. you know, they really wanted to get that because we understood that there, there's a segment of the youth population that we're not connecting with because we don't have anything there. They, you know, they love hoops, you know. You know, particularly from a New York standpoint, but even from an L.A. standpoint, from a Lakers standpoint, you know, that sort of encompassing all within the city. But how do you connect with them? You know, Ali being, you know, Ali really drove that. You know, obviously, hey, I sent him some line art. I, you know, I won't even sort of take credit from that. He came up with the color blocking. I was transitioning out. So Jesse Leva actually um, finished that up. Mm-hmm. I sort of laced him as he was coming into the category, like, yo, I got this here. Nice, nice way 90%. to start your uh, yeah. salary. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but it really didn't get anything. Like, he, they did it. It was seeded. It was sort of a buzz. But then that's when sort of the Nike talk and the internet piece sort of started taking off. And it, it, all that just, you know, a lot, I mean, just think about it. That stuff didn't happen. Where will we be today? Yeah, yeah. yeah. From an overall, there's a bigger piece. Yeah. You still need to innovate and, you know, you know, I still believe in, you know, new products and new models and new innovation and not just relying on the past. But to be able to have, you know, both pockets filled with with opportunities, pretty dope. Yeah. D- Drew, I want to ask you a little bit about Nike's leadership over the years. It's Mark Parker, who kind of rose through Nike from a product role to later become president and to later become CEO. He's no longer the CEO. The interesting thing about Mark Parker is he took over from a guy named Bill Perez, who, again, just to go through Nike's history real briefly here. Who fell in the who fell in the Nike Lake, you know that, right? Yeah, I've I've heard that, I've heard that story and the the story with the Jets. So so Phil Knight was the co-founder and CEO for a long time. And then there's this brief blip in the Nike history where there's a guy named Bill Perez who did not come from the company and, and he became CEO in I think December 2004 and only lasts until January 2006. Mark Parker, a product guy, takes over from there. Mark Parker is CEO for a long time. After that, right now, you have John Donahoe, who, again, to me, looks a little bit like a Bill Perez figure in that he comes from the outside and he doesn't come from a product standpoint. Do you remember when Bill Perez took over at Nike? What was the feeling like there? And is there any, if you pay attention to the leadership currently, is there any parallel between him and John Donahoe at the company right now? I think Donahoe's big difference is that he has that digital Mm-hmm. piece which is mm-hmm. so which vital is what nike right wants now. Yeah. yeah nike Don't wants in the company it's just like it's just sort of rolling you know not that i lose sleep over but i i would be concerned about the company just really losing its soul mm-hmm. um but that's what i'm saying just, like if the leaders are not from 
the company, you're not from a product background like people like Phil Knight or Mark Parker, you know? It, it can eventually catch up. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I worry about is that they, they've sort of lost their soul. Perez's challenge as well was um, Knight just bounced and he came in and, you know, the, the, the old guard wasn't accepting. So he had a hard time anyway. Mm-hmm. And then he was a he was a he was a package goods guy. And this mm-hmm. is completely different sort of business where at least Donahue's coming in with the digital police, which is, you know, everybody's trying to embrace and it's the actual. I mean, you know, if you think about it, Nike should have been more aggressive and again not closing the urban guys, but they should have been direct retail years ago. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you got the market on lock. You could sell less product and you get better margins. They were just scared from a retail standpoint because they weren't good retailers. And right. They had to change that culture, bring those folks in, and then get the sort of the, the the digital sort of landscape sort of down. And that's what you're seeing sort of sort of sort of happening now. Well, Drew, we appreciate you taking the time. I know that we could probably go in for hours and hours on your stories. Um, one thing with your agency, do you, are you working on any footwear projects? Are you, are you still kind of ingrained in footwear before we go? Pandemic, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pitching, so to speak. I got some yeah. pretty interesting okay. sort of going um, as, as relates, related to that. But um, yeah, I'm, this, this will help. <laughs> okay. As related well, to that. Awesome. But I, yeah, I still do some consulting on some apparel as well as um, sort of footwear stuff, individual branding, you know, stuff sort of outside of that. Um, Yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll be on the lookout for that, and we can't thank you enough for sharing your stories. So much history. Your name always pops up in conversation, so it's really great to chop it up with you. Very very humble. Appreciate you guys uh, taking the time. Here's some of this. I think it's important, particularly, you know, naming some of the other folks that were sort of involved as they're late to making this stuff happen and, it's just unbelievable to see here we are now. I mean, even even your shows yeah, and where yeah. you guys are at, appreciate I just it. think it's serving well, and you guys are doing a great job, and, and, and appreciate it. Appreciate it, Drew. Thank Thanks you so much, stories, man. Appreciate so it. Important. Thank you. Have a good one. All Thanks, right. Drew. Later, man. Well, that's this week's episode. Hope everyone enjoyed it. We'll all be together next week, right, Joe? Yes, sir. <laughs> see you next week. See you next week. See ya.